the minister who fails to practice what he preaches places himself in a precarious position. Unfortunately, it is a position few ministers avoid. I remember clearly the Sunday that I was in that precarious position of preaching what I wasn't living. Today we began a journey into practicing Sabbath rest. For the past few lectures, we have talked about how rest is something that God enjoys. We've spoken about the image of God in man. And the image of God in man is seen in man as man works, but also we reflect his image by resting. He gave us an example in Genesis 2. We have talked thus far about trust. Trust is essential to rest. And God takes pleasure in our trusting Him to where we get to a point of resting in Him. God also takes pleasure in this word Sabbath, which means to rest or to cease. And the Sabbath is given to man, not merely for the sake of man, but also that man might give Sabbath as an offering back to God, and the two join together, man and God, in times of deep solemn, sacred rest. We also talked about perspective, that God takes pleasure when we take on His bird's eye, or a better description is God's eye view of things. Be still and know that I am God, He says. I'm in control. I am above the nations. I'm above the earth. That's God's perspective. He invites us to enjoy, but also to enter into His perspective. However, as individuals living on this earth, we tend to get a different perspective, a worldly view, a view that makes us despondent, discouraged, defeated, angry. But God in His love and grace lifts us up to a point of getting a perspective. Solitude and rest is often a cure to a worldly view. And then we talked about how God enjoys His people when they've understood that, yes, we are to be right, in right relationship with Him, and also to be tight with God. And I call that particular chapter the pleasure of His people. Sabbath, or rest, is the pleasure of His people. As God's people, we really want to be right with God, and God has taken the initiative to bring us into His presence through Jesus Christ, saving us from the consequences of sin and the wrath of God, but also sanctifying us, bringing us into a right relationship with His Him, with Him, uh, justified in Him, and in the process being sanctified in Him. All of this pleases God. All of this pertains to some action and avenue of rest on our part with cooperation, uh, in cooperation with God in every way. Now I want to go on into the practical steps of having a Sabbath retreat or experience for yourselves. These are high platitudes, we might say, what God wants, but we're down here. How do we please God in all of this with actual steps of entering into a Sabbath with Him? Now, I began reading from chapter 6, which is also session 6 of this book that I wrote some time ago, For God's Sake Rest. The minister who fails to practice what he preaches places himself in a precarious position. I remember clearly the day that I was preaching the fourth commandment. And perhaps, Lois, you remember that day as well. Uh, I was preaching through the Ten Commandments, which is quite common. Pastors do that. And they were going rather nicely. And I prepared well for this sermon. I worked very hard. I looked at the texts about Sabbath. I looked at the fourth commandment. I read it again and again. I read many commentaries on the topic. And I'd even been to Israel a few months prior to this sermon, and I'd watched how the Jewish people shut down all the mercenary activities and solemnly 
went to worship God. Now, some of them just walked through the motions, but others were very sincere at meeting God in what they called Sabbath on their Saturday. All this was great preparation for a sermon, and the text was well understood by me, I thought. The uh, points were parallel, the subpoints were nicely put in place. I illustrated it uh, by talking about what I saw in uh, Israel and all of that, and it seemed like, well, this is going to be a home run sermon. But I got up to preach it, and I realized, okay, I got Sabbath in my head, an understanding of it in my head, but my experience was not there. And I didn't need to ask anybody whether I thought they thought I was rested. I knew I wasn't rested. I knew I hadn't experienced Sabbath, and they knew it as well. Did you know as well, Lois, that... Um, Absolutely. There was no rest in our lives, well, and it uh, wasn't just uh, you, it was both of us. So what symptoms, do you recall any symptoms of my life, maybe our whole family? Uh, we were always on the go. Um, there was never, there was any, never any really stopping. Yes, the, Jim would take the boys and they'd go fishing, or we'd go back to Minnesota for a week of vacation, but we were always doing something. There was nothing, there was no place where there was stopping. Um, we were always tired. There was always something more to do. So I was preaching this sermon and I couldn't conclude it. Uh, I finally had to admit, look, I've prepared this sermon on the Sabbath, on the Fourth Commandment, but uh, I'm no example of rest to you. I haven't figured out how to do this. I don't know where to begin. And I finally had to, in humiliation, end the sermon and walk down, and I was humiliated. I was in despair. Like I said, the minister who does not live what he preaches is in a difficult, a precarious position. And every once in a while, a minister would get to that position. Mine was over the Sabbath. So where did we go from there? Well, I had some friends that had been requesting that I take a week. In fact, on the trip to Israel, LaRue Lindquist, the then president of the Holy Land Institute said, Jim, why don't you just take a week away from the church, away from your home, go some, to some solitary camp or retreat place and pray and fast for a week? And I thought, how can I do that? I'm the only pastor of this church. I have limited secretary, secretary help. And how am I going to do that? Uh, if I go and do that, the church will disappear, fall apart in a week. Of course, that's rather egotistic to think that the whole church was leaning on me to such an extent that I couldn't be gone for a week and they'd all fall apart without me. So uh, I didn't do it at his request. I had another friend who said, well, why don't you take a day? And oh, I couldn't do that. Uh, there aren't enough days in the week for me to get all my pastoral work done as it is. How can I take a day out? But finally, after preaching this message and a few other difficult things that happened regarding people, some losses, some friends moving away. I just felt so despondent, so discouraged. I said, I'm no good anyway to these dear people. What do I have to say to them if they call on the phone? What encouragement can I give them? I am so discouraged myself. I am so wore out. How, how can I be an instrument of peace and rest in their lives when I don't have such peace and rest in my life? TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. So I set out, I went out to indeed okay, meet God as had been suggested. And it was a cold morning and I was equipped uh, in a, my little car with uh, wool clothing. Uh, I had some old boots I put on. I wrapped myself up and it was quite cold, but it was sunny. 
And I just sat in the car. I was at a solitary place, a park that had little activity in it, a lot of foliage and wildlife and trees, and it was a pretty spot. And I just sat in the, in the car and didn't do anything for a while. And I describe myself as being like an onion and, and the peels of the onion, the various skins of the onion were, were being peeled away. And I became so relaxed and my concerns just seemed to fall aside at that point in time. And it felt so good, so relaxing. I hadn't relaxed like that for I don't know how many weeks or maybe months, maybe years. And I was enjoying the time just being a person as I've called it, I became a human being rather than a human doing, constantly doing something. That activity had ceased for a while. And then God began to unfold various aspects of my life, which I'll talk about later. But just to let you know that it was a time of five hours in the car. I began to journal about my life. I began to relax. I began to be honest with myself before God. And I felt refreshed. And then I got out of the car and went for a walk. And I began to see things in a different light. I, I saw various details in trees that I hadn't noticed before. I saw the shadows and the sun hitting the trees and the terrain, and it was beautiful. Before I was just rushing by all the beauty of God's creation, wasn't enjoying what he had made for me to view and observe and really wasn't that close to God because all of the things and responsibilities were in front of me constantly. Now I was always about doing them. And then I came to a maple grove and I found a maple tree and I sat down under it very still, very quiet. I was dressed warmly so I wasn't cold and the sun was bright shining in and then something broke the silence. And then I saw a deer, a doe, a female deer and her fawn come around and they didn't notice me. And they walked in front of me and they were beautiful to watch. And they were relaxed. It seemed that they were very cared for. They had a good caretaker, it seemed. Someone had been watching over them and they were relaxed. And then I heard another sound and behold, a majestic buck, well-balanced antlers. And of course, as a hunter, I was alerted to that. And wow, this was quite a scene. He was a beautiful animal. And he came out from behind the trees and he saw me right away. And it was like his eyes opened wide and stared at me and, and looked. And then he, he moved hoping I'd move that I would declare myself as a living thing, but I was propped against the tree and as still as I could be. And he moved back and forth. Then he hid himself behind a tree and waited and waited and it seemed like forever, but I was not going to lose this contest. I was going to be more still than this majestic buck. He was going to have to move before I did. I was not going to let him know that I was alive and well. And he waited and waited and finally he gave up. I won the contest and he jumped from behind the tree and took off in the direction from which he had come. It was a beautiful scene and then the doe and the fawn eventually caught scent of me and disappeared as well. But I rose from that tree with a simple message. The one who cares for these cares for me. That is our God. That is our Lord Jesus Christ. And I could relax in his care. I could enjoy quiet rest. And I called that my first Sabbath experience. And I went home and Lois, I don't know if you remember that particular day, that first time, six hours out in solitude by myself. I'd never done anything like that to my knowledge. But do you have any recollection of that or earlier Sabbaths at that time? I do remember that first one, not in great detail, but I know that um, Jim came home a, a somewhat different person. 
and we sat down together and we talked about what had transpired during those hours that um, that you were on your first Sabbath. Uh, back then we called it just going to the park. We didn't call it Sabbath. We didn't call it rest. We called it going to the park. And that was the beginning of a theme that started taking place in our lives. And eventually, not just in his life, but in my life as well, he talked about how God had taken him back to his past and was beginning to peel away layers of things that were not not good, that were, were not healthy, let's put it that way, that weren't healthy in his life. And things that were probably affecting us in our marriage and with our two sons. Um, and that was the very beginning um, of what took place, started to take place in um, his life and then uh, later on in both of our lives. So Sabbath, that first Sabbath, was the first step in a long journey of transformation. Are we perfect yet? No. Obviously not. Uh, may I just say that I had enough in my background for a lifetime of unraveling in Sabbaths. And I think most of us do. But we begin to face ourselves in the presence of God. And that's where the changes begin. So this Sabbath talk is not just about needing rest, but it's getting rest rubbed deeply into your soul and your, your heart and changing your life and making you a restful person, not just on the outside where you look rested, but internally. And that's what we all want. And there are various things in our life that block the intimacy with God. And it's through such times of review under God's bright lights. If we dare, if we're bold enough to enter into His presence as He says, come, and I'll fix you. I'll care for you. I'll bring rest into the deep crevices, the private parts of your life where you are disturbed internally. And we do so much in this modern or postmodern era of trying to look rested and attractive on the outside. Yet inside we're screaming, we're desperate, we're unrested, we're unraveled. We are not happy people and that's because we have not allowed God to enter in the deepest places. It's more or less, we have to go under his microscope, under his surgical tools, and we have to allow ourselves to be on his surgical table to work internally. And I'm gonna talk more about this in the sessions to follow.